wider world. Before I formally welcome uh, our very distinguished speaker, Mr. Nainan, just a few announcements. Uh, we have a number of other programs uh, in Red Soul ones, I won't read all of them out. Those of you who are interested, there is a small booklet, uh, and you're welcome to pick it up, it's, it's available outside. The program is also on the website, and we hope to have the whole of next year's program up sometime early next week. Uh, tomorrow, which is the Friday, the 30th of September, Dr. Suzy Garu from the English and Foreign Languages University, very distinguished uh, and eminent scholar who needs no introduction, will be speaking on a small history of health. Here in this room. On Tuesday the 17th, the uh, regular Tuesday weekly seminar, Dr. Jaya Pyagi of Sri Venkateshwara College on retrieving women's agency from Puranic traditions, representations and representations of women in the Master Mahapurana. On Wednesday, uh, we have another public lecture in the Science Society and Nature Series by the winner of last year's Norman Bollog Award, Dr. Aditi Mukherjee from the International Water Management Institute. The subject is an evergreen revolution in Eastern India, are we on the right track? The uh, following Monday, the 23rd, Mr. Raza Khan from the Berlin Graduate School, Muslim and Cultures and Society Group, Berlin, will speak on minority past, the other history of a Muslim locality, Rampur, 1889-1949. And the following week on Tuesday, the 24th, uh, Dr. Jinu Zaharaya Umen, uh, who's at the NMML, will speak on Gulf migration, and Transnational Religious Networks, Understanding the New Religious Movements in Kerala. And on 25th, the next lecture in the India and the World, Wider World Series from Seema Alavi of Delhi University on Muslim Cosmopolitanism in the Age of Advance. A couple of other small announcements. Uh, we have a set of new papers due either today or tomorrow in the Occasional Paper Series. Uh, they are available outside for a very nominal cost. Among those which are out are Number 22 in History and Society, Richard Hart, An Unmanageable Encounter, The Meeting of Religions and Cultures in Chicago, 1893. Uh, number 23, The Northern Way of Bengal, 800 to 1500 of Common Era, History Apart, Rila Mukherjee, and Dalavai Norogy and the Evolution of the Demand for Swaraj, which is number 25, by Dinyar Patel. The other series on Perspectives in Indian Development, uh, we have uh, two new publications, Refugees and Migrants in South Asia, Nature and the Implications by Parsa Ghosh, and Mapping Literature, Culture and Region Formation in the Brahmaputra Valley by Manjit Bhatt. So, privilege and uh, honor to welcome uh, one of India's most distinguished journalists, who's also been a very eminent commentator on public affairs, not only on business in a narrow sense, but the economy in the wider sense, uh, Chris T. N. Nainan. Uh, he's presently chairman of uh, Business Standard. Uh, he uh, has, at various times, uh, work with major uh, media houses, journals, and newspapers, been editor of the Business Standard, Economic Times, and Business World. He was also uh, in, uh, executive editor of India Today. Mr. Nain is recipient of uh, several awards, including the B.D. Goenka Award for Excellence in Journalism. He is presently holder of the Jawaharlal Nehru Fellowship, and uh, he tells us he received his MA in Economics from the University of Madras in 1970. I'm sure you're all waiting to know the thoughts, so without further ado, India in a changing Asia, Mr. Tiyana. Uh, thank you, Mahesh, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, the uh, international relations um, is not a subject on which anybody would credit me with any expertise, uh, but uh, for some reason that is what uh, Mahesh's team invited me to talk about. Um, so I have, uh, and um, you see why at the end, uh, whatever subject you put before an economic journalist, he'll come back to the economy. Because uh, for, a, for a hammer, if you have a hammer, anything that you see is a nail. So in that sense, I will, as you see, come back to the economy at the end of about 20 slides. But how much time do we have? Um, and I want to start with uh, two or three maps, um, some of which uh, you may have seen. Uh, this one is now, I think, quite well known. Uh, it was put up on, a, I think they call themselves a social media or entertainment and information website called reddit.com by somebody with some kind of long plume. Um, and uh, there is this little population bubble that you see on the map of the world, uh, which is done as a flat sort of thing. 
and um, it occupies roughly one sixth of the globe. Um, but as you can see, most of it inside the bubble is water. And yet, it says there are more people living inside the circle than outside of it. And you can actually expand on it by saying that there are more poor people living inside the circle than outside it. There are more Muslims inside the circle than outside of it. Um, and of course, more Hindus and more Buddhists and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, it is, gives us an interesting perspective on what part of the world uh, we're talking about. Um, and this is a, another interesting map uh, put out by um, somebody at the London School of Economics, um, I think in uh, 2010 or thereabouts. Uh, and he tried to map the economic center of gravity of the world. Um, and uh, if you go back to 1980, uh, the center of the world was somewhere in the North Atlantic uh, to the west or northwest of the Canary Islands uh, of the North African coast. And uh, the black dots are as the center of world economic activity has shifted globally uh, every three years. So uh, the last black dot is, uh, I think, 2007, and the red dots that follow are the projections for the future. So you will see the second red dot, uh, which is 2013, uh, has it somewhere in southern Iraq just now, and um, it's headed for North India and then further east to China. So that's the direction in which uh, the world is moving. And the same story, more or less, uh, but slightly differently, is told by this uh, McKinsey map, uh, which I've taken from The Economist, and which you may therefore have seen, uh, which starts with um, the year 2000, over here, 1 AD. And you'll see that 1 AD to 1000 AD and 1500 AD so very little change. They're all centered north of Kabul. Not that Kabul is important, but um, that's where the center was if you take the world as a whole. And then it swung rapidly north and west, um, and the movement in that direction stopped in or about 1950, um, north of Iceland. And then uh, as the developing countries uh, became free and then began to gain momentum, uh, you've got the reverse shift happening, and uh, in 2010, uh, you were still uh, in northern Russia, uh, heading down towards southern Russia, and further down eventually into Xinjiang, and we don't know where else. But uh, it tells you that the speed of the shift back in roughly 75 years, including the projection till 2025, um, compared to the speed outward is broadly the same because if you start from 1820 and not from 1500, then it took 130 years for the center of the world to shift all the way up north and west. And now it's taking in about, uh, what, 65 years to swing back. Uh, just for vital statistics to put this in context and then move on, um, Asia has the uh, largest share of the world landmass. Of course, it has by far the largest share of the world population. Uh, it also has now the largest share of world GDP. Um, but in share, in, in its, uh, as a percentage of non-Asian per capita income, it is less than one third. So, if you're looking at, uh, if you believe in convergence theory, then, uh, and if convergence of income is going to happen, then there's a long way more for Asia to go, even though the center of the world at the economic activity has already shifted towards Asia. And just to take another take on that, the largest economies last year, uh, I put the three uh, Asian economies in bold, uh, and, and you will see that uh, this is in nominal GDP, not uh, purchasing power parity. Um, so you'll see that uh, US, China, Japan, and India comes in at number 10. And if you take the next 10, you'll get three other Asian economies. 
uh, Indonesia, I think Iran and Saudi Arabia, or South Korea, and uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran is just below that. Um, this is a bit of a surprise, uh, and Credit Suisse uh, puts out um, an annual report on the world's wealth, and the 2012 report uh, looked at the figures for 11-12. And um, now you had Asia, where they look at, they break it up into three regions, Asia, Pacific, China, and India. And if you take those three together, then as a share of total wealth, uh, Asia now comes up ahead for the first time. Uh, ahead of Europe and North America by a little bit, not by much, but still, uh, the uh, maximum share of wealth now is in Asia. Uh, we also happen to be the world's largest consumers of energy. Uh, the last line at the bottom says that uh, Asia's energy consumption in terms of oil equivalent uh, million tons is equal to North America and South America and Europe combined um, at uh, 5 billion tons of oil equivalent annually. Um, China's number one, India's number three. So on down the line. There are four economies uh, in the top eight. Um, if you leave aside the predominant power of the U.S., uh, we also tend to have one of the largest spenders on defense, and you see uh, Saudi Arabia emerging here as a significant player. Um, Japan, uh, uh, one must note, uh, is limited to its defense spending by, uh, it has to be uh, within 1% of GDP. Um, so they have uh, a large Coast Guard, which uh, is sometimes called uh, Japan's Second Navy, uh, because uh, some of those Coast Guard vessels are bigger than the Indian Navy's largest surface vessels, uh, excluding the aircraft carrier. Uh, they have um, vessels that are bigger than our largest destroyers and frigates, and they're still part of the Coast Guard. Uh, so uh, Japan's numbers have to be taken with a pinch of salt. Then if you look at the uh, future, um, Asia is clearly going to be the prime mover of change, uh, whether it's uh, economic growth, uh, the growth of the middle class and the consumption story. Um, cities uh, and clusters emerging as growth centers. And then whether it's energy use, travel and transport, um, militarization, financial services, uh, most of the uh, additional activity is going to be uh, within Asia. Um, that sort of sets the um, broad context for looking at uh, different parts of Asia and trying to see where India uh, fits in with each of them. Um, I am sort of characterizing this as five mini Asia, the five specific regions. Um, I'm actually, Northeast Asia, other is just putting South Korea and Taiwan together because it didn't fit into any particular uh, category that made sense. And Central Asia is small and it's a completely different ball game, so I'm leaving that also out of the reckoning. Uh, and looking broadly at China, uh, Japan, um, West Asia, uh, and the ASEAN. And I'll try to all of them. And you'll see that West Asia, ASEAN, and South Asia have broadly comparable GDPs. Uh, the population numbers, of course, are radically different. Um, China and Japan are the two biggest economies, but once again, their population numbers are radically different. So these are very different regions within one continent. Um, it used to be that almost all the countries here had the focus of their economic activity um, in relation to the West. And in the last uh, two or three decades, that has changed dramatically. Asia is now engaging much more uh, with itself. <coughs> um, ASEAN, the 10 member countries of the ASEAN, uh, their trade with China is now greater than their trade with the US and Europe combined. Um, Chinese trade still uh, has a significant component with the US and with Europe, uh, but still Asia is the largest component, and in any case Chinese ODI official uh, development, uh, official direct investment, 70% uh, of it goes to Asia. Uh, in fact, 90% of Chinese foreign investment 
uh, is in uh, emerging markets. Uh, a lot of it is in Africa. And only 10% has gone into uh, the developed economies um, of the North, so to speak. Um, but the bulk of it is in Asia. Uh, half of Japanese trade is in Asia. Uh, Japan's largest overseas investment by far, uh, nobody comes anywhere close, uh, is with China. And uh, you, these days of currency issues, you have the swap that the Chiang Mai Initiative had, uh, basically uh, an ASEAN plus uh, categorization uh, for uh, currency issues. Um, India does fit into this broad picture. It's not uh, an outlier. Uh, more than half our trade is with Asian countries, um, partly influenced by the fact that 90% of our oil supplies are from West Asia, but 8 of the 15 largest trade partners are in Asia. So even we are uh, increasingly uh, Asia-centered in a way that we were not before. I mean, if you go back to pre-1991, uh, our largest trading partner was the Soviet Union, and then it became uh, the U.S. and Europe, uh, but now clearly uh, it's Asia. Um, so when you have um, Asia becoming the center of uh, economic activity, um, and you have Asia engaging far more with itself, what has been uh, our response to this emerging reality? Uh, we're all familiar with the uh, 1991 uh, Lukis uh, initiative that uh, Narasimha Rao uh, put into play. Um, and uh, I think less talked about, but well known, is um, what Manmohan Singh did in 2005 when he said that uh, the region uh, to our west is also part of our national hinterland and should not be neglected and we should be making moves um, to um, to integrate and have far more uh, sort of ties with, with West Asia. Um, in fact, he wanted uh, a free trade agreement uh, with the Gulf Cooperation, Gulf Cooperation Council countries, GGC, the six members of the GGC haven't gone anywhere. But um, we do have uh, FTAs, economic partnership agreements, comprehensive economic cooperation agreements, etc., etc., but broadly all FTAs. Uh, with uh, several uh, countries in East Asia, including ASEAN itself, and the original one which was with Sri Lanka uh, in our neighborhood. Uh, we have a de facto open skies policy, um, and you can see the terms given to the Gulf Airlines, uh, you can see the terms given to uh, Singapore Airlines, um, more opening up towards Hong Kong. Um, so, air traffic. Uh, is certainly seeing an Asia-centric uh, uh, policy. Um, I think the large problem with, uh, that stares us in the face uh, in terms of economic integration um, with uh, the region is that um, our economy is not yet ready for it. Um, with some of the countries where we have signed FTAs, uh, Indian business complains that uh, they can't compete that uh, imports into India are growing much faster than exports from India. Um, and so they don't want these agreements to become deeper um, instead of being shallow. Uh, at a time when uh, a single common ASEAN market is more or less a fact of life, um, uh, we are held back to some degree by the fact that we've not been able to achieve the same progress economically. Uh, and I think this is an issue which we need to keep in mind because uh, with the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, Initiative by the U.S. and the Trans-Atlantic Partnership Initiative uh, between the U.S. and the European Union, um, you, particularly in the context of the, um, of the Doha Round basically being uh, dead, uh, and if you have large new trading blocks emerge, and then ASEAN is able to engage with that because they are effectively one market, then you uh, could get left out and you could find yourself at a disadvantage. So uh, this is something that we need to be conscious of uh, when we look at um, India's role in a rising Asia. Sorry. Um, 
then I'm looking at the specific uh, sub-regions that I mentioned. Uh, we have with ASEAN uh, continuous upgradation of engagement. Um, the uh, regional forum uh, for country partner dialogue. Uh, we have uh, joint naval exercises with some of the countries in ASEAN. Uh, ASEAN itself has ambitious uh, rail and road link plans uh, going up all the way up the spine and then all around into China and into one spur into Burma or Myanmar on one side, a part of it going off, another spur into China to Kunming. Uh, so a serious transport integration uh, which is planned. Uh, we too have um, some kind of plans but uh, at a lower level of integration and I think uh, further into the future in terms of the pace at which the work is being done because we'd like to take uh, road link through Myanmar into Thailand and then link up with the rest of ASEAN. Uh, it's possible uh, at some stage we even think in terms of a rail connection uh, going all the way. Uh, but certainly that work is not progressing at the speed at which it's going on within ASEAN and connecting up with the Mekong Basin and, and China. Um, the uh, slow integration with the ASEAN uh, common market uh, really leaves us in some ways as an outsider looking in, uh, and I, I mentioned this on the previous slide. Um, Japan is uh, also a very interesting case. Um, I don't know if how many of you remember that when uh, Abe was Prime Minister in his first term, uh, somewhat brief first term, uh, he came to India in 2007 and spoke to uh, uh, the Indian Parliament uh, in a speech that uh, effectively set bilateral relations on a new course. Uh, he called it uh, the confluence of two seas, uh, which is a title that uh, resonates with uh, the title of a book uh, written by Dara Shuko in the 17th century. And uh, basically tried to build an argument for very much closer uh, integration between Japan and India on several fronts. And the phrase he used in that speech was the arc of freedom and prosperity. And uh, when you look at the country that he mentioned, uh, it becomes very obvious what he was trying to do. Uh, because the arc of freedom and prosperity included Japan, uh, India, uh, Australia, and of course the U.S. Um, so um, China was not slow to see what way this was headed, and when um, joint naval exercises under the quadrilateral initiative uh, were planned, uh, China quickly said, this is Asia and NATO, uh, designed to contain China in the way that NATO was designed to deal with Russia and the Soviet Union. Um, and then uh, countries got cold feet. Um, India would say that uh, uh, the same Australian Prime Minister who just lost office in his previous term as Prime Minister, and he's a Sinophile, um, didn't want to do anything that would have been China. So uh, he stepped pulled back from this. You were then left to the trilateral. But then India also didn't really want to annoy China and be seen as doing anything specifically anti-Chinese. So it hasn't got very far. Uh, but I think the idea survives, uh, and we'll see the surgeons at some point, is what I think. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Japan has begun seriously investing uh, in India's future um, uh, by putting a lot of money into India uh, in the form of very soft loans, uh, sitting here in Delhi, uh, I'm sure everybody knows that the Delhi Metro is financed essentially by Japan and very soft loans repayable over long term uh, at virtually no rate of interest. Um, they've invested, they've given money for a lot of infrastructure projects, they're willing to bankroll uh, the trade corridors um, and lots of other things. Um, so, and we've seen just the other day that they were willing to come in with a currency swap when we needed to get extra depth to our reserves in case there was a problem with the currency. Uh, and, and that, I think, added a lot of confidence uh, to the rupee's position. Uh, so it is a very important player just now in, in India's primary needs. Um, and then when uh, China began uh, using 
its uh, dominant uh, control of the production of a whole range of rare earths uh, in the global market. And uh, using uh, refusing to supply if you offend the China in the way that Japan did when they had that uh, Coast Guard episode. Um, Japan and India very quickly got together and said we'll cooperate on the production of rare earths in India. Um, so you can see that Asia, Japan is looking for friends, uh, India needs a friend, and this is working very well just now. Um, the problem, of course, is that uh, we are still seen as a potential large market, not really a large market. If you look at uh, Japan's investment flows, um, I forget the exact percentage, but it's very tiny, the investment in India. And you look at their trade flows, and again, we are small in relation to Japan's uh, overall trade pattern. So, uh, but it is, uh, I know that there was a um, track to um, trilateral dialogue uh, at the end of May or early June uh, in Tokyo with India, Japan, and the U.S. And um, some of the largest, uh, I believe seven of the ten largest Japanese um, companies were in the room and they were all expressing impatience of wanting to invest in India. Uh, and worrying about our infrastructure constraints because um, they weren't, they really had enough of China and they just wanted to come in somewhere else. Um, but we haven't yet got to act together. So there is an enormous potential building up here in the two countries. Um, China, of course, is the elephant in the room. Um, Lucien Pai, who is an authority on the subject, um, wrote some years ago saying that China is a civilizational state pretending to be a nation state. Um, so if you ask yourself if that is the case, uh, what are the elements of that civilization? Um, and one element that you could pick out uh, is the concept of Confucian harmony, uh, which is that you must know your place in the world. Uh, and it is a hierarchical order. Uh, it's not an order, it's not a situation, a harmony based on equality. It's a harmony based on knowing where you stand in relation to others. Um, you have the whole idea of the Middle Kingdom and the mandate from heaven. Um, and um, if you go back to the, uh, I think, 18th century, when George III sent uh, Lord McCartney um, to uh, the Chinese court, and uh, sought permission uh, to open embassies in the two countries, uh, basically to facilitate trade. Uh, the Chinese emperor thought that this was somebody who would come to pay homage uh, and uh, dues and respect uh, to a superior power. So that's the worldview, and uh, I'm not sure if that centrality of China, that, that worldview has changed in any way. Um, I would uh, also look at how in the contemporary context uh, China has um, seen its uh, international position. Uh, and I look at the three phases of its, uh, what was briefly termed the peaceful rise. Uh, the first was of course uh, Deng Xiaoping's um, well-known 24 character uh, prescription for uh, China's international posture. So basically, you better keep your head down, uh, guard your position, uh, protect your interests, but bide your time, in, in, in summary. Uh, so that is the policy that China followed for a long time. It didn't engage in a lot of multilateral stuff in the way that India did. Uh, it just uh, wanted to make sure that its own interests protected and, and, and lay low. Um, and then in about uh, 2003, uh, at a place on the Hainan Island in southern China, off the southern China coast, uh, they have an annual uh, Bao conference, Bao Forum for Asia, uh, which is uh, some kind of answer to uh, the Davos meeting, uh, with the focus being on China. And they invite all the countries from Asia and people from other continents. And the uh, Chinese theoretician, um, set out for the first time this phrase, peaceful rise. Uh, that China needs to rise, but it will rise peacefully, it won't be a threat to other countries. 
um, a year later, I think Hu Jintao went to Bao and um, changed the word uh, rise, saying that might cause offense uh, to peaceful development. Mm -hmm. um, but by, and then by 2010, uh, you had a change of tune. By now, the Chinese economy had really begun to blow, and China had become conscious of its power. And in 2010, at the Shangri-La Dialogue uh, in Singapore, which is again an annual meeting, uh, the Chinese foreign minister, uh, and uh, when he spoke, he said, uh, in relation to all the other countries that were present, and most of them are from around China and Asia, and he said, China is a big country. And all these other countries are small countries. And that is a fact. Which was basically now putting an end to the peaceful rise thing and saying that we are now, you have recognized that we are the big boys um, in this part of the world. Which uh, then, you know, was matched by uh, aggressive postures in the South China Sea, uh, their uh, new formulations vis-à-vis uh, -vis the Indian border and the line of actual control. And then China began to get a pushback uh, from Japan on the Singapore Islands, uh, from Philippines and Vietnam and other countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, and India to some degree. And so uh, in uh, the summer of 2013, uh, again in the Shangri-La Dialogue, uh, the uh, deputy chief of the uh, PLA uh, stood up and said, uh, all countries are equal, whether they're big or small. <laughs> so they, they realized that they needed to pull back, this was causing too much of a problem. But uh, in um, track 1.5 kind of meetings, uh, the earlier position actually continues to get articulated that anybody who thinks of this place as a multipolar situation has better think again because, um, you know, you have to deal with us. So uh, those are the three phases of uh, peaceful rise. Uh, and I treat these as Verities because I think these are not things that will change over time. Uh, these are now here to stay. Uh, and once again, uh, going back to the civilizational state and the art of war, um, the highest form of war was to be to achieve victory without fighting. Uh, that's the formulation. I, I don't have the exact words. I have them somewhere, but, uh, but that's the sense of it. That, that if you can win without fighting, that's the, that's the highest form of war highest form of the art of war. And uh, the way they do that really is to constantly uh, look for leverage uh, and uh, putting new facts on the ground, changing the dynamics of the situation to their advantage without actually provoking open conflict. And uh, if you try to study what's been going on uh, on our uh, border with China um, and what's happened over the years, uh, you will see uh, that they've done this very well. They've actually followed the art of war prescription very carefully. Uh, they have uh, improved their physical infrastructure, their communication networks, uh, new roads, a very impressive new rail line, uh, first into Lhasa and now south of Lhasa into the Spurs that are coming closer to the Indian border. Um, they have put stronger missiles uh, on the plateau weapon plateau. Um, they have put in new airstrips. Um, their mobilization capacity is uh, gone up dramatically. Um, up to 400,000 troops can be mobilized very quickly. Uh, so, and then, uh, with their superior power, they are basically testing you at different points on the board all the time. Um, and we don't get to know everything that's happening because it's kept under wraps. Um, but to my knowledge, uh, there is far more that goes on than comes out. And uh, this is a constant game that they're playing, basically to, to improve their leverage position, to put new facts on the ground, and uh, without actually causing conflict, improve their position on negotiating whenever they want to negotiate the border, if they want to negotiate at all. Um, and then, um, 
just to close the view on what China actually is, and uh, I don't know if you, anybody wants to contest this view that I have, but uh, Lee Kuan Yew, in a con conversation with somebody I know, uh, said you cannot uh, you cannot believe that China is just another major player. Okay, it's more than that. Um, and uh, the uh, key fact is that in the same way that Australia withdrew from the quadrilateral and we are way now is about uh, causing uh, anything which will cause a rupture with China, all the individual countries in the region, uh, who all, many of them are allies of the United States, and the, and the U.S. has been the sort of local policeman for everybody's comfort for decades. Um, and the U.S. being uh, challenged uh, in the region, uh, and if you talk to Singapore or Indonesia or other countries, nobody actually wants to take a position to choose between the two, because China is going to be there forever. So uh, you can already see uh, what I call the Finlandization of East Asia, in the same way that Finland would never do anything to upset the Soviet Union or Russia, but they're just so scared. Um, you are, in a sense, seeing the Finlandization of East Asia. Uh, but we must also recognize that um, uh, China is at a disadvantage in uh, giving full expression to its sense of power, <coughs> which is that uh, it has its, it doesn't have a clear field ahead of it. Um, one, it has uh, other major powers in the region. Uh, you have Japan, uh, you have Korea, you have Australia, you have India, and if you take the combined uh, defense budget, just these four, forget ASEAN for the moment, you just take a combined defense budget of all these four, they are uh, slightly bigger than defense budget that China has. And then you have the U.S. on top of that. Uh, so it's not that China has a free run. Um, they have geographically what are called the first and second uh, island chains, uh, which constrict the way their navy can move. Um, and so it's not a clear field, uh, but the fact is that China is now a fact of life that we have to deal with. Um, where India comes in in this context, um, and my view is that China's rise is for us a diplomatic opportunity. Um, the truth is that while nobody likes to say so, everybody is running scared of China. Um, some of the Western powers, including Australia, and I happen to uh, talk to their senior most uh, diplomat in their foreign office sometime back. And he was talking like everybody else, saying there's a plan A and a plan B. And plan A is basically, you hope that China will be a normalizing power. And plan B is, what if it isn't? Um, so, uh, the plan B and what if is where India comes in for practically everybody in the region and those outside. Um, if you listen to uh, Robert Blackwell, who is, I think, writing a book, I don't think it's published as yet, if I'm not mistaken, but it may have been. But uh, he says in the book that um, uh, you have to recognize that there would have been no Indo-US breakthrough without China. The breakthrough came because the US needed India, India needed the US, and that's why it happened. Japan's lack of democracy is entirely because of China. Whether it's Singapore or Vietnam or Indonesia, all the countries of Southeast Asia, are all looking for uh, a new counterweight uh, to China. And they all want India to get involved. And uh, the problem, I think, is that uh, we're not living up to their expectations. And the constraints are, uh, again, economic. It's, it's the unequal trade that we see in terms of integration. It's a whole series of asymmetries in power uh, which are uh, staring us at us. So, uh, the way I put it is that we are the default option for all these countries when they say, I'm going to deal with China now in the future. Um, but we are the defaulting power. And then, um, briefly, our uh, border context. Uh, we've been on a defense acquisition drive. Uh, we've got lots of, we've got two new army divisions, new airstrips on the border, uh, new aircraft ordered or coming up. Uh, lots of new ships, uh, we're improving the border infrastructure, all somewhat relatedly, some 10 or 15 years after China began doing the same thing. And now with the announcement of a fourth strike corps, 
we are actually building up uh, offensive capabilities. The other three strike corps are really aimed at Pakistan. This is the first time we have a strike corps that's an offensive uh, formation which is targeting China. But defense spending is still only 2% of GDP. Uh, the National Security Advisory Board said long ago it should ideally be 3%. That's been the norm set, but we've never actually got there in the last 20 years. Um, and uh, last year, uh, the, the defense acquisition budget was slashed in the last minute by 10,000 crores. And uh, looking at the budget for this year, and what is already committed, uh, including the big aircraft order, which let them come through, basically you have no money for new weapons. Uh, the fact of an economic slowdown, the need to control the budget deficit and the fiscal squeeze has, uh, is impacting uh, defense preparedness. And when one recognizes that all power is relative, uh, the inability to match uh, what you have to face up to is a problem. I'm not saying that we're pushovers. I'm saying that uh, we have to think primarily in defensive and asymmetric contexts to deal with the power requirements. Um, a lot of what I've said relates to what has been happening so far and what is the current situation today. Uh, to me, the most significant uh, factor which will influence the next 30 years, starting now, not starting 10 years from now or something like that, but starting now, is the fact that uh, populations all around us are shrinking. Um, China's uh, workforce uh, has peaked already. It was expected to peak by about 2015. Uh, they have officially announced that it's already peaked in 2013. The population will continue to grow, but the workforce has already peaked. Um, and in this very interesting uh, set of numbers, uh, if you look at primary school students uh, back in 1990 and in 2011, uh, the number of primary school students in China, and these are 1,000, so it's gone, dropped uh, from 122 million to 100 million. So these are going to be your future workforce. And India has gone from 96 to 152. So you're going to be throwing in far more workers than if you say the productivity improves when you have a larger percentage of the population within the workforce. These students who passed through primary school in the last 20 years are the ones who are going to be in the workforce for the next 40 years. So India's workforce will be, and these are numbers you can't change. And particularly because of the skewed uh, boy-girl relationship, because of one-child policy, uh, there are fewer girls. And so there are going to be fewer women who can bear children. And population size is determined by women, not by men. Um, so. Uh, there is talk now of China moderately changing its one child policy. Uh, but even if they did that, it will take a good 20 25 years before they have the mothers who. And then, if you, more women are going to be out of the workforce, tending to family and children at home, that's going to affect the workforce. So, there is, I think, no question that China is going to lose momentum. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to maintain momentum when your workforce is shrinking. Um, and. Um, your, the uh, recent reports on uh, on wage levels, they're all climbing. Uh, you have uh, very labor intensive uh, industries moving out of China. Textile is a good example. Uh, I think a lot of the assembly work in electronics will become unviable. Uh, and the only country which will have numbers uh, to absorb that is actually India. And if these guys were leaving China, and looking for new places to go, are going to the Philippines and to Vietnam and to Bangladesh and God knows where else, and they're not looking in India. That is the extent of our failure to provide the environment in which you can create new manufacturing jobs and then seize the, un the final opportunity to gain greater momentum than China. Um, the last region I'm going to look at uh, West Asia. I mentioned that in 2005 there was talk of uh, looking west as well. Um, and everybody knows about the oil and gas and Indians in the Gulf. Um, the point I want to uh, emphasize is uh, the changing oil dynamics. With the advent of shale oil and gas, uh, the U.S. 
uh, is looking at possible self sufficiency some years down the road, not immediately, but they are already reducing imports, uh, which is why China is, uh, if you remember the slide I put up at the start, um, China is already the world's largest oil importer, who taking the US. Uh, and the US has got new sources of supply because uh, in South America, uh, new countries and new oil fields are being discovered. Brazil is becoming suddenly a major player, bigger than before. Um, I think some Indian companies have invested in Brazilian fields. Um, so uh, I think the US imports from uh, West Asia are now down to 2 million barrels a day. That's half of what we import. Um, and it may disappear completely from the area. Um, Europe is much more into uh, North Africa, Caucasus, Russia, um, Central Asia pipelines. Um, and you may find, therefore, that 90% of the oil in the Gulf is headed for the big four Asian markets, so Japan, China, uh, South Korea, and India. And um, you are already beginning to see the um, change of equation between suppliers and uh, consumers because, you know, the whole OPEC power system or syndrome has given way, if you recall, uh, the Saudi uh, king made his first visit to India back in 2006 and was chief guest of public day. And then Manmohan Singh went back in 2010. And um, one of the things the Saudi king uh, said, to, said to India was, uh, why aren't you buying more of our oil? because uh, we, were we were getting supplied essentially from Iran, which was number one, and then Iraq, and then a lot of other countries. Uh, he said, well, no, you should be buying our oil. And uh, if you look at the next three years of what happened to India's oil purchases after the king left, uh, and before Man Mohan Singh went back on uh, the return call, um, our reports from Saudi Arabia are multiplied tenfold. And from next to nothing, they became our largest source of oil. Uh, and this is actually a fairly major democratic move. Um, and you saw that in what became a strategic uh, partnership with the Mon Singh visit to Saudi Arabia. And then they began handing over these um, uh, terrorists, Abu Jindal and one other guy, uh, in the teeth of Pakistani opposition. Uh, they actually had it more. The first time they caught it to us on, on terrorism. Um, so, it seems to me that if uh, the Gulf oil producers are going to be looking for markets, and we're going to be one of their biggest, um, it's an opportunity, theoretically. Uh, and that, I think, is a game changer. <laughs> Coming to the end, um, just one point five minutes. Um, I, I said, what is the takeaway that I want to leave with everybody? So, I did a little swat. And what is our strength? Um, sorry, this is the one earlier thing. It's the first line in strength is missing, which is um, that we are a large economy and uh, we have market power. Uh, that is the first and most obvious strength that we have. Uh, the second is that uh, we are a status quo power. Now, some of our immediate neighbors may not see it that way. But as far as the rest of the world is concerned, we are a status quo power. We are not seeking territory. Uh, other than wanting uh, a place on the high table, we are not seeking to change uh, the world. We are taking the world as it is. Um, meaning you want to place in the Security Council, you want to be part of the nuclear club, you want to be part of the missile technology control regime, and so like that. So you want a place on the high table and you believe you, you, you belong there. But other than that, you are not uh, trying to change global reality in the way that you could say China is trying to push the U.S. out of Asia and saying you can go away into the Eastern Pacific. Um, and uh, we do have a multipolar worldview. We are not looking for dominance. We believe that several countries are great powers, and that's a good way to be. And so you invest in the U.N., you want the ASEAN to be the central player in East Asia, uh, not somebody else, uh, and so on. So 
So it's a, these are strengths when other countries look at you, because you're not a threat to them, and you're also a large market with a big potential. Uh, the weakness is, of course, the economic underperformance. Uh, the minute you began to do well economically, the whole world is engaging with you, uh, and everybody is coming to you, and uh, the Ministry of External Affairs couldn't cope with the rush of visitors uh, that kept coming. And the minute you underperform, uh, once again, the world begins to start losing interest because saying, uh, these guys never get the act together. So economic underperformance, I think, is the principal weakness. Uh, the opportunities I've mentioned, uh, one is clearly the, the fear of China that exists even if nobody wants to admit it. Uh, two is the changing oil dynamics. And the third is the demographic transition. And these are all factors that are not here today and not tomorrow. They are sort of fundamental seismic changes that will affect the next 20 years at least. Uh, and a threat clearly is China. So, as I said at the start, if you give uh, the hammer to an economic journalist, he will finally say it's the economy is stupid. Thank you very much.